for those of you who have really good memories, you're probably wondering why we're hearing a different story about Jesus calling Peter and Andrew to be his disciples. Because last week we heard John's version of their calling story, and this week we get Matthew's. The best we can guess is that these stories both probably happened, but perhaps with a different pair of brothers. It doesn't really seem to matter, though, who exactly it was being called. The amazing part was in how they responded. And Matthew says it happened twice in one day. Jesus approached two pair of brothers while they were working, and without hesitation, all four of them dropped what they were doing and started following Jesus. Now, I think everyone can agree that we are all called to something. It's a common phrase that it's somewhat hokey, but we usually use it to make people feel better about something that they really don't want to do. Clearly, this was not the case for Peter, Andrew, James, and John. It seems they were more than willing to accept God's call. Their response is flabbergasting. And without knowing what they were thinking, most of us just don't get it. Seriously, one minute they're at work, and the next, They've left everything they know, family, home, career, friends, hobbies, perhaps even wives and children, just because some guy on the beach said he'd teach them how to fish for people. Whenever a Bible story makes absolutely no sense to me, I have to assume there is something I'm missing, some context that I just don't understand. So allow me to share some background information that I found very helpful. Several years ago, I heard Reverend Rob Bell, who's the pastor that makes the NUMA videos that the youth are watching. And he had some really great contextual information on this scripture. Here he is. He said, education was huge in Jesus' day. It was primarily religious education and only for boys. But the closer you live to the temple in Jerusalem, the more opportunities you might have. And there were three stages of this Jewish education. The Bet Safar, Bet Talmud, and Bet Midrash. Bet Safar usually occurred from ages 5 to 10 and was taught by the rabbi. During this time, good Jewish boys would memorize the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, memorized by the age of 10. Now, by the age of 10, if it were clear that you weren't going to hack it, if you weren't the academic type, if you were not at the top half of your class, say, the rabbi likely told you, go home, Learn your father's trade, get married, have babies, hope that they do better. But the boys who were doing well, who excelled, they would go on to Bet Talmud. From age 10 to 14, they would continue memorizing now the Psalms, prophets, and the rest of the Hebrew scriptures. Bell says, it wasn't uncommon in that day for a good Jewish boy to have the Old Testament memorized by the age of 14. Now, even in a society largely based on oral tradition, this is still quite a feat. So, of course, in those four years, many distractions would arise, and only the boys who excelled, who became now the best of the best, would continue to the next stage, Bet Midrash. At the age of 14, the best of the best, the Harvard and Yale of Jewish boys, took the next step, and they would approach a rabbi to, and request to become his disciples. So then the rabbi would quiz them to determine if they were good enough, if they really were the Harvard or Yale, if they could one day be like him. 
if he thought they were a worthy student, if they were truly the best of the best of the best, he would say, come, take my yoke upon you and become my disciple. And just like that, the boy would leave everything, home, family, friends, community, and devote his entire life to following this rabbi, to being just like him. There is a book called the Mishnah that is basically like all the commentary ever written about the Torah. And, it is, and, in, one, and in it, one of the sages once wrote, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. It was a phrase meant to encourage students. Rabbis would spend their days taking their disciples around, teaching them, and as they traveled from place to place, they would literally kick up a cloud of dust. And because the disciples were following the rabbi, at the end of the day, they would actually be covered in the dust that their rabbi kicked up. So it was sort of a blessing for students. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Enter Jesus, walking along the beach, some of us may think of him with golden locks flowing in the breeze, billowing robes, however he may have looked. We know he was beginning to get his own reputation as a rabbi and a healer. As he was walking, he came upon some fishermen casting their nets. They were fishermen, probably in their late teens, early 20s, which meant they hadn't made the cut. They were not the best of the best of the best. They couldn't hack it in school. They weren't going to be anybody's disciples. So here they were fishing. And out of nowhere, here is this rabbi coming to them, calling them to be his students. He didn't quiz them. He didn't even ask them any questions. He didn't need to know if they were worthy. He simply said, hey, come follow me. Be my disciples. I'll teach you a new way of fishing. And just like that, they went from dropouts to disciples. This was their second chance, their golden ticket. It was seriously a miracle. I think it might be comparable now to an adult child of a migrant farmer who had been picking produce since they were 10, and one day out of the blue, they received an acceptance letter to Harvard without even applying. So of course they dropped everything and followed Jesus. And I'm sure their fathers wished them luck shaking their heads in amazement, and surely they felt a sense of pride. Christ purposefully chose the dropouts, the failures, the ones who couldn't hack it by the world's standards. He called them and gave them instant redemption because when a rabbi chooses disciples, it means he believes they can be like him. He believes in them. All of us are called. Perhaps we know the exact type of ministry we're meant to do, or the way in which we are meant to follow Christ. Or perhaps we're still listening and discerning to figure that out. Or maybe you thought you knew what you were called to, but it seems like things are changing. Whatever the case, you are called. And that is a miracle. Our callings mean that Christ believes we can be like him. God sent Christ to earth, called together a ragtag group of dropouts and outcasts, and then left it all up to them, to us. God must have immense faith in us, crazy faith. We would never trust ourselves with such an important task. But guess what? God does. 
Because God knows we wouldn't attempt to do it alone. You see, the losers and the failures are chosen so that the world can see God's power and grace. We claim our call, when we claim our call from God to be like Christ, we recognize God's faith in us, and we respond with greater faith in God. May we truly, today, embrace our callings and know the immense, crazy faith that God has in us that we can be like Christ, and may we all be covered in the dust of our rabbi. Let us pray. Holy God, help us to hear your call in our lives. <coughs> Help us to respond with great joy, knowing that you believe in us, that we can be like you. And help us to follow closely behind our rabbi, Christ. Amen.